juga uh, showing upside down. So, hello, ma'am. Vanna, ma'am, can you hear me? Professor Vanna Sunalkar, can you hear me? You will have to unmute yourself. I guess there is some internet issue, but uh, okay, she will join, I guess, in, in a few minutes. And uh, hello, everyone. I hope all of you are doing well. And uh, since we are resuming our session, uh, after, I guess, more than one month and last time, when we had our uh, uh, last hello. session, Yes, yes, ma'am, we can I uh, I don't know what's happening. Just a moment. I My camera is not functioning properly. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, ma'am, we will wait for that. So, after this deadly pandemic uh, period. Now I, it was functioning earlier. Okay. I can't hear you also very clearly. Ma'am, can you try logging out? Just log a moment, maybe I'll it will be better if I put on my headphones. Okay. Ma'am, you can also try logging out and logging in. Once again. Hello. Yes. Yes. Hello. I'll go off and come back again. Just a minute. Okay. Okay. Sure. Ma Okay, so till ma'am join us on this platform, uh, it's good to see you all again after so many months uh, and those months which have been very terrible. So, and after that, we are starting with this fourth lecture, which is on the Dalit feminist theory. And uh, it's a very pertinent topic, even though we wanted it to happen somewhere in April, but uh, we, due to the pandemic, it couldn't be uh, uh, adjusted. So, and uh, for today, we have Professor Vanna Sunalkar as the speaker, and uh, uh, 
uh, Sunana Arya uh, as the moderator of the session. So Sunana, are you there? I am there. Yes. Okay, good. Good to see you here. And, oh, uh, yes. I'm also very really happy and I am really much, uh, you know, uh, grateful that the philosophy project is doing great work, amazing work. And I'm uh, glad that I'm also a part of it. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Sonalkar, for joining us. Uh, so... Uh, everybody knows Professor Sonalkar and uh, she has served for a long time as a professor in the Advanced Center for Women's Studies uh, in the School of Development Studies as, at this Mumbai Tata Institute of uh, Social Sciences and she has been director of Tara Bai Shinde Women's Studies Center and she was a graduate in mathematics economics at the University of Cambridge and she received a PhD from Department of Economics at uh, uh, Dr. Baba Sahab Ambedkar Marathwada University and everybody is aware uh, who's working on uh, you know Ambedkar and gender question in uh, South Asian uh, perspective she's aware about uh, everybody's aware about her work so she is presently a member of the ec of indian association for women's studies and working as editor of the same newsletter and uh, she has translated very important works from marathi to english uh, one of it is uh, we also made history and uh, then uh, comrade Arim Bore, she has translated that also from Marathi to uh, English. That is, uh, that would be translated as, uh, you know, Memoirs of a Dalit Communist, uh, The Many Words of R.B. More. This published in 2020, and uh, she has tra translated some poetry, which is published by Sahitya Academies, Indian Literature and Elsewhere. And currently her book, uh, which is creating many, you know, uh, thought-provoking discussions uh, is called Why I Am Not a Hindu Woman. So I am really um, grateful to be here uh, with you and very much looking forward to listening what you have to share from your wisdom with our uh, students and everybody who's attending this session. So uh, Professor Vandana now. Thank you. Welcome, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, you are not audible. You will have to unmute. Uh, thank you very much, Sunaina, for uh, this generous introduction. I'm happy to be here. Um, I hope that this will be a dialogue more than a lecture. Uh, so I will speak. I will speak a little bit about uh, you know, the, how the, our understanding of what Dalit feminism is has changed over the last 30 years or so. Um, and um, of course, there are writers even before that. And Ambedkar himself was so aware of the relationship between um, caste and patriarchy. Maybe he did not use the same vocabulary that we use today but he talked about women as the gateway to the caste system. Um, and I think even uh, his uh, Hindu code bill uh, also reflected this kind of understanding. <clears throat> but um, since around 1990, I would say, the discussion of uh, Dalit women's issues and a need for some kind of Dalit feminism um, has been, you know, uh, in the air. One of the ways that uh, the subject is referred to is, you know, to uh, talk about Dalit women as the downtrodden among the downtrodden or to assert that the Dalit woman is subjugated because of caste, class and gender. 
but as uh, one writer has noted, these these phrases tend to reify the li living social relationships that constitute Dalit women's lives and to locate Dalit women as objects of pity. If we are to steer clear of this, it will be helpful to look at the lessons of Marxist and feminist standpoint theories because Sharmila Rege also talked about a Dalit feminist standpoint. This is a debate going back to the 1990s when um, Professor Gopal Guru asserted that Dalit women talk differently. Uh, he was, in a sense, challenging uh, Indian feminists who uh, formulated Indian feminism in a particular way. And then there was a response from Sharmila Rege saying that the feminist movement should adopt a Dalit feminist standpoint and that non-Dalit feminists should reinvent themselves as Dalit feminists. Now, um, what is this Dalit feminist standpoint? In fact, feminist standpoint theory uh, was something which was being discussed in the late 1970s and 80s. Um, and uh, feminists at that time were trying to draw some parallels with Marxist theory. Uh, because Marxism sees the contradiction between labor and capital as being at the heart of the contradictions of modern society. Uh, and I'll say a little more about this later. But I think the Black American feminist, Bell Hooks, puts it very well. She says about Black women, those at the very bottom of the social hierarchy see more broadly the condition of society since they are not blinded by the rewards of that society and are consequently less committed to it. They are more in contact with the truth of society. Uh, end of quote. I find that there is a kind of anarchist spirit being expressed here by Bell Hooks, a celebration of a rebelliousness, you know, not accepting society as it is. So that we can read, you know, when she talks about the truth of society, it is something which, you know, uh, with our postmodern post structure. It seems that ma'am's network connection is interrupted. Yes, yes. Stop now. Uh, we'll have to wait for some time. Pros and cons of having online lectures. <laughs> There are uh, some issues which are being raised by the participants and I hope the team will take care of it.
Madam, can you hear us now? Yamini, I can see that uh, there are two accounts of Yamini in the list. So if, if they are the same person, then please exit from one of the accounts. Welcome, ma'am. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm back. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Ah, uh, right. Uh, so what I was I was talking about bell hooks. Uh, now, when she's saying that black women have a kind of privileged view of society because of their position, uh, I think it cannot be read as an invitation for white feminists to reinvent themselves as black feminists. Uh, you know, so that's where I would slightly disagree with uh, uh, Sharmila Rege. And uh, OK, I, as a Savarna feminist, will not, uh, will say that I cannot have exactly the same standpoint as the Dalit feminist, OK? But I can understand an analysis of society which uh, uh, takes this Dalit feminist standpoint into account. And at the same time, around the same time in the mid 1990s, uh, the claim for self representation was being made by several Dalit women's organizations around the time of the International Women's Conference in Beijing. Uh, this was a uh, demand, you know, that uh, women's organizations dominated by upper caste urban women cannot speak for Dalit women. So uh, this whole thing, sometimes this whole, even the category Dalit feminist is being questioned because Dalit in a sense is a sociological term describing one's position in a caste society, whereas feminism is an ideology. It is, uh, 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 so anyway, I would say, you know, again, I would talk about our society as being governed by a form of caste patriarchy, uh, which is a term I would prefer to Brahminical patriarchy because then we start talking about different patriarchies. Anyway, let us go back to this idea of feminist standpoint uh, and uh, how at, in those days, of course, in the 70s and early 80s, um, a kind of dialogue with Marxism was still quite fashionable and was still something which was uh, taken seriously. <coughs> And while Marxist project was certainly the emancipation of the proletariat, the working class, his analysis of capitalism did not so much privilege the standpoint of the proletariat as to try and lay bare how the labor capital relation is basic to the functioning of the capitalist system. This leads us to insights on the nature of state power, of the role and changing nature of the market as it treats not only produced goods and labor, but increasingly diverse aspects of human life and the environment as commodities subject to the laws of demand and supply. I think this describes the world of, of uh, governed by global capitalism that we live in today. This implies obscuring the real changes that are taking place in relations between people, 
It implies obscuring the links between production and people's needs, the nature of poverty, and the generation of new kinds of equality as people's aspirations and mobilities change, while the old forms of inequality are far from being eradicated. And I think in the time of the pandemic, all this is even uh, more important to keep in mind. Can we take, undertake a critique of caste society in India in which Dalit women's subjugation is the central object? Something like this was being envisaged by Ambedkar when he talked about women being the, the gateway to the caste system. But to answer this question in a contemporary, uh, uh, contemporary context, let us just say what Western feminist standpoint theory has now moved beyond the realization that liberal democracy divides men's social existence into a public and private sphere, that it is in the public sphere that the citizen enjoys rights and equality, whereas women are relegated to the private sphere. It is, of course, well known that one of the earliest slogans of the women's movement uh, was the personal is political. But in my uh, in my article uh, entitled An Agenda for Gender Politics, which was published in, by the EPW in 1999, I argue that the way that uh, Ambedkar's whole uh, concern in bringing forward a Hindu code bill you know, as parallel to the constitution, as a code, you know, it, rather than just having sets of personal laws and why a hindu code because this society is a, uh, has a majority of hindus and practices like caste uh, among hindus uh, are you know even uh, to some extent prevalent among muslims and christians and so on and so and he thought that uh, to reform Hinduism or to give a code for personal laws within Hinduism uh, would set an example for society as a whole. I mean, it's not as if he's against uh, the idea of a uniform civil code, but this is a step towards that. Anyway, what he says, I think, uh, you know, my, my reading is that uh, for Dalits, there is no, uh, you know, the, the, one cannot say the personal is political in the same way because there is no such, I mean, one is not allowed a private sphere at all. I mean, whereas women, you know, are cut off from the public sphere, you can talk about middle class women who are confined to the home and who are, are not expected to take part uh, in public life. The same cannot be said of Dalit women because economically they have to go outside the home uh, every day to earn their living. Uh, and the way that the caste system functions is not to allow any privacy uh, and uh, to for caste Hindu men to exert their dominance over Dalit men through the medium of women's bodies. Okay, now, and therefore, um, Ambedkar feels that one has to have a progressive code for personal laws which cover marriage, divorce, adoption, inheritance, uh, and where religion has a large part to play. Okay, and so he, he made it, you know, he made people who wanted to get married under uh, undergoing Hindu rituals also uh, could have intercaste marriages, you know, uh, rather than having to go to a civil marriage under the Special Marriage Act, which was the case earlier, uh, intercaste marriages, uh, so, and various things which and there's a certain kind of progressive code that he lays down. Of course, uh, 
he was not successful in this, even though some of the laws proposed were later passed, this idea of a Hindu code uh, was unacceptable uh, to the uh, Brahminical uh, Orthodox, uh, even within the Congress party and within the government at that time. And Ambedkar finally had to resign over this. Uh, okay, now what I'm saying here is that uh, when we are talking about a feminist standpoint, uh, today it's not just, we can see that the personalist political has a different kind of uh, meaning for Dalit women who are not allowed a personal sphere at all. And, there, and the practice of caste somewhere uh, you know, uh, oh, spills over from the private into the public because uh, caste discrimination involves, uh, you know, certain areas being closed uh, to Dalits or um, the practice of untouchability in public places, you know, whether it is certain tea shops not being open to Dalits uh, or whether it is uh, various practices which may have decreased today, but which have not entirely disappeared also. And violence against Dalit women is also a part of all this. Now, I don't really want to talk too much about the issue of violence in today's lecture. I really want to concentrate more on what um, various theorists uh, including Gopal Guru himself in his latest book uh, on, uh, you know, the everyday social uh, uh, with Sundar Sarukkaya and even uh, the sociologist uh, Suryakant Vagmore talks about this. So when we are talking now about a certain assertion by uh, Dalit women in various spheres. You know, now it is not just the associations and the organizations which were set up in the mid-1990s and later on as well, trying also to find a voice in international forums and so on. Uh, but we also now have uh, Dalit women scholars uh, in uh, academia, uh, in universities abroad, uh, asserting themselves in literature as well. So the impact uh, of what one can call a Dalit feminist standpoint, perhaps, is now apparent as it was not so much uh, 20 years ago. Okay. It's, it's coming out much more. Uh, and uh, I think that is you know, one of the questions I raised when um, I gave a few lines to uh, Professor Sunaina uh, on the topic of this lecture was, why should women like me, who I'm a feminist, but I don't come from a, a, a Dalit background, why should I be interested in the, the issues of Dalit women? Is it just a sense of justice towards those less fortunate than myself? Or can understanding the viewpoint or the standpoint of Dalit women help me to understand the society that I live in? Because caste affects us all. And uh, patriarchy affects us all, men and women. And the kind of society we are trying to build uh, now, let's see. I'll quote from um, Gopal Guru again. Uh, Modernity is the process of discovering the individual under its protective social covering. However, in doing so, it has gone to the other extreme of reifying individuality. And he says, you know, it, he wants us against mixing up the social individual kind of dichotomy with the public private kind of dichotomy. So one, if we are trying to understand caste, uh, you know, what is our relationship with society? 
in my book, uh, Why I'm Not a Hindu Woman, one of the things I remarked was that um, the family or, you know, certain kind of patriarchal norms are imposed on us not as religious norms quoting some authority. I mean, we do talk about the Manusmriti as being the site where many, uh, you know, extremely Brahminical and patriarchal values are actually set out explicitly. But there is an argument, that, I mean, after all, we don't turn to the, we don't have a copy of the Manusmriti uh, in every Hindu home in the way that the Bible used to be in every Christian home at least a few generations ago, at least maybe two generations ago, uh, or uh, it may not be the case now. But uh, on the other hand, people will be practicing Hinduism and they have internalized the um, rules and regulations and the values laid down in the Manusmriti in a way without actually having to refer to the text and disciplining people who violate these norms of caste and patriarchy uh, is something that we do to each other. You know, we don't have to call, we don't have to refer to a religious authority, uh, but very often it is women who police the practicing of patriarchy. I mean, very often men argue that, you know, women are the, the worst enemies of women, but the system does function in this way. The system functions in a way that very often it is not just the upper castes who can, in fact, tell themselves that we, they are free of any kind of caste prejudice or even of an awareness of caste because they are privileged. Uh, it is more the middle castes and that is where how the caste system works, who consider themselves to be superior to Dalits, uh, who are uh, most often actually invoking caste. Uh, and this is not to fault anybody. It is often older women in the family who impose patriarchal values on younger women and sometimes even on the younger men. Uh, so I think, you know, the fact that today young Dalit women are expressing themselves. And I will draw a parallel with um, Black women's assertion in the US, which I think has also come to a certain, uh, you know, stage today. I mean, I think I've only been uh, to the US once on a, just a few days visit, but I remember walking on the streets of New York in 2012 and seeing black women walking around with a sense of confidence and, uh, you know, even a rebellious kind of air. Uh, race functions in a slightly different way because, you know, your caste is not actually written uh, on your face or uh, it, it is not a, a, an anatomical characteristic. Then you have to be identified by your caste, by someone asking you your name, your background, your this. And that is why even Ambedkar felt that maybe uh, urban life would give a certain kind of anonymity and a certain freedom from, uh, from the practice, the everyday practice of caste. But I think recent scholars and, you know, um, even artists have shown that even in the cities, uh, the everyday practice of casteism continues. And, uh, you know, there is a segregation. People do live in colonies. Uh, yeah, that's how colonies come up, whether it is in the slums, whether it is in the chawls, whether it is in apartment blocks, uh, that uh, people tend to have neighbors from the same caste. This is more so than it even was, uh, let us say, 50 years ago, 100 years, years ago, when cities were being formed or when Ambedkar had this hope that uh, moving to the cities would emancipate you 
from the shackles of casteism and that they would there would be a certain anonymity there uh, but in the everyday practice of caste then we should now be aware and expose the way in which caste operates in daily life uh, these little humiliations and it is uh, I, you know i do find that women are talking about these things you know and then even this question of um, casteism of patriarchy within the dalit community i felt one of the most beautiful expressions about this was in the autobiography of baby tai kamre uh, you know where she is she talks about the man of the house you know who she's talking about village life outside the house he is subjugated a little bent uh, he does not have authority when he enters the house his back straightens up and he is ready to assert his authority over the women of the house you know now um, and there is a certain sympathy in this it's not as if she's condemning uh, that figure either so there is a sympathy um, together with an awareness of how cruel this can be especially on younger women um, in the household and so on so this complex understanding which i think you know we have to have much more exposure uh, to these complex relationships in a, more, a context of an evolving and contradictory modernity you know it's not as if things aren't changing they are and yet caste is not being eradicated and if we can be more aware of the ways in which it operates uh, i don't think it is now so easy for the upper castes at least those who are more sensitive to say that you know we don't practice caste we know nothing about caste gradually the concept of privilege and being aware of privilege is being talked about at least and i think this is this is where um, art and literature uh, can also play a, a great role you know um, and where these little aspects of how self assertion works how resistance works and how uh, it is put down how one struggles and one doesn't always fail uh, to gain a new kind of self confidence that's why now um, gopal guru talks about becoming and belonging okay he talks about identity in these two forms okay you become a member of a club because you join it you pay the fees you uh, uh follow its rules and so on you become a citizen of your country because of the constitution which gives you certain rights and so on but you belong to your social group uh to your family and that he's trying to find the uh, differences between this notion of identity as as something that you become that you in a sense consciously um follow certain rules and acquire certain rights um and a sense of belonging where you are a part of a certain community uh and you know so then this whole question of identity politics and so on um as is, as i uh, quoted before modernity is the process of discovering the individual against uh, under its protective social covering okay but the reification of individuality has not gone so far in india yet um though there are changes even in the way that the family function it's not just the extended family being replaced by a nuclear family but we now have families derived from adoptions we always had them actually uh i think you know and 
I've seen this, in fact, quite a lot among Dalits that uh, when I was in Aurangabad, uh, the community of academics, because the difference between Dalit academics and non-Dalit academics was that they would, the, the, the Dalit professors would have relatives living in poverty, close relatives living in poverty, uh, who needed uh, some kind of support. And very often adopting a child uh, from, you know, a, a brother's child or a, uh, uh, someone and, and bringing that child for an education uh, into the city was a very common practice. So families derived from adoptions, same sex couples having children on, on a global level, transgender families. So we now do have a kind of escape route from the traditional uh, notion of a patriarchal family setup. And he says, this is, I think, very important because we must understand the kind of society we are trying to bring in. The escape from the family is not necessarily a society of single men and women, but a social group with more fluid notions of the natural and the individual. You know, the natural, uh, you know, this notion of the natural sometimes covers, you know, blood links, even uh, being member of a caste is seen as something natural rather than social. And against this is posed the Western enlightenment concept of an individual, uh, you know, something to which the notion of merit is also very much attached. You know, individual merit, it is what uh, your intelligence, your hard work that has got you somewhere, forgetting that that is all in a setting of uh, a certain social background. Uh, and uh, that is why uh, you know, we need some form of um, affirmative action, uh, what we have in, in uh, reservations, which are very late, 70 years after independence, beginning to now bear fruit in what I'm saying, you know, this kind of assertion, a more articulate kind of assertion by Dalits and Dalit women in particular, because there is a struggle for feminists, you know, to be taken seriously. This has been there always. Uh, I know a writer like Urmila Pawar has been criticized for being critical of men of her community or even make being humorous about uh, marital relations, you know. Uh, and um, I know that uh, even when I quoted Urmila Pawar and Minakshi Moon's book in you know, talking um, to a refresher uh, course class of, of uh, teachers, it is not acceptable to talk about uh, you know, some of the insights that Dalit women give us which may be critical also of Dalit men. Um, so it's not a question of Dalit patriarchy. Patriarchy pervades the society. Patriarchy is one of the ways in which uh, caste is also perpetuated because it is mainly a control on the sexuality of women. And of course, now with a, a, a greater awareness of the uh, among the LGBT uh, community, uh, certain practices which were just pushed under the carpet, which were not talked about, uh, people's personal choices are at least now being talked about a little more openly than before. All these things are good. And th th this is what is the form, kind of society that we are moving towards? I'll go back here to Marx and say that, you know, um, men, there have been forces of emancipation that have um, improved, you know, have brought us to the kind of assertions, the kind of understanding that I've been talking about. But at the same time, um, something like 
the total privatization of healthcare. We'll talk about the time of the, the pandemic. I mean, even the pandemic is generated in a world where, for one thing, medical research and uh, you know biotechnical research has been taken over by private companies. A world in which uh, international travel has become much more common as well. Uh, and a world in which healthcare has been totally privatized. So our very clumsy, I'm not now talking just about the Indian government, but all over the world we have found very clumsy re responses to the pandemic and surely a reminder that state responsibility for health care is an important part of the state's responsibility to, to its citizens you know because again if you uh, one of the st statistics i read is that um, dalit women's average lifespan is some 15 years or more less than the average lifespan of other women because of health issues, because of the total neglect of health, uh, because of the unavailability of uh, state-run health care. So if we can remind ourselves that it is a global capitalist taking over. Uh, can you just excuse me for just a minute while I answer the door? It won't take more than a moment. So again, uh, caste patriarchy collaborates with capitalism when we have a sudden stoppage of uh, modern industrial activity and normal life in, in cities. Uh, what happens is that no arrangements are made uh, for the vast number of people in what we call the unorganized sector. Uh, and we had these horrible pictures of people walking thousands of miles uh, to their villages. Okay. Um, there is a total collapse of small businesses, which affects their employees uh, and uh, you know, policies on agriculture, this is what the farm, farmers are raising. It is a farmer's movement, but it affects agricultural laborers as well. What I'm trying to say here is that, yes, caste patriarchy and capitalism working together. Let us understand this rather than just talking about Dalit women being exploited by caste, class, and gender, or the new term intersectionality, you know, where again, uh, I think Kimberly Crenshaw, when she first used this term, she, she was talking in a legal context of uh, the relationship between unions and the right to represent you know, and uh, where there were, there was a black employees union and a women employees union. And 
black women have to choose between one of the two to represent them in their grievances. Whereas the compound effect of being black and a woman, an employee, and the grievances that arise from that, uh, there is in the kind of way in which demo democratic um, trade unionism is formulated legally, it has uh, uh, black women have no place to speak. You know, that, that, that is the kind of thing she was talking about. Today, when we talk about intersectionality, it is, you know, uh, yes, we must look at uh, a, a woman's caste, class, and gender to understand where she is. It is a much more individualistic approach also. You know, you, you look at women singly and then say that, uh, yes, uh, their, their subjectivity is of you know being of a particular class as an agricultural labor or a domestic worker um, of a particular caste and so on uh, and also being a woman let us go back to these structures of caste patriarchy and capitalism and see how they are working today i think the pandemic has exposed the inequalities in a very stark way and I, I, you know, the, the demand for state responsibility for education and health, which have been, you know, I mean, the, the neglect and the callousness on these scores has been so much, uh, so horribly exposed. Uh, it is a prime concern for Dalit women, you know, uh, where literacy rates, yes, have gone up. But Dalit women will still be in the lowest strata as far as education is concerned. I was very shocked to find, you know, that there was there was all uh, all this disruption uh, in uh, you know the, the the relationship between middle class households and their domestic help. Uh, it's it's again. Uh, such a stark contrast between the living standards of the domestic help in their homes and the living standards of the homes where they work. You know, so that, that peculiar kind of um, intimate contact and um, stark difference in uh, income levels and standards of living uh, were again exposed when there was a cut, you know, um, many middle class and households had to uh, do without any kind of domestic help. But even so, I do not see uh, Indian middle class feminists taking up the question of division of labor within the household as a major issue for feminism. Uh, and, you know, neither among upper class, upper caste women, nor among uh, women of the middle castes, do you find a better realization of uh, this, the, the need to share housework, for example. And again, you know, the, the communities work in different ways. There are different neighborhoods where neighbors help each other. Uh, more in in poorer communities, whereas uh, in the better off communities, they are much more cut off from each other, but they do rely on their paid domestic help. Now, we must understand all these contradictions within our society when we are talking about the kind of state we want, the kind of laws we want, the kind of arrangements for our health um, and education. Uh, you know, and it's so obvious because where there have been Anganwadis uh, for working women, even in the most rudimentary form, where the Anganwadi workers are not even given the status of government servants, and uh, you know they are not even paid proper stipend. I mean, they are not paid wages; they are paid kind of stipends which are 
inadequate. Even so, the work they do is so enabling for women going out to work, for, uh, to, to leave their children and uh, in some kind of an institutionalized setup. Now, oh, th this is how uh, understanding the situation of those who are really deprived, uh, those who really have no privileges in this society, should help us to understand the structure of our society as a whole and to understand that to build a better society for our children and for our future requires a sensitivity to these things. Yeah. Um, I read all kinds of odd things. You know, the, I read a, an interesting novel by a black American woman called The Other Black Girl. It, it talks about a woman learning to be an editorial assistant and, you know, having ambitions in working in a, in a big publishing house in New York. And she's the only black woman in the entire staff. And so she talks about, uh, you know, her experiences on a day-to-day -day basis, how she's, how she confides in, in a black woman who is her friend whom she sees after work. And then another black girl joins the firm. And then, you know, how things play out. Um, again, these are the kind of things we should be writing about, about work situations. Uh, we should know, understand more about these things, about our academic establishments and how people from different backgrounds are made to feel, how students uh, are made to feel in, in these kind of institutions. And I think it's beginning. That's why we come back, you know. Um, I'll just make another remark before I end, you know. I agree with what um, Gopal Guru is saying about uh, a society with more fluid notions of the natural and the individual and all that. But when he's talking about becoming and belonging, uh, you know, belonging has a sense, he does mention this, when you belong to somebody else, this is a notion of slavery. But men still have a notion of women, you know, their women, of, uh, you know, marriage being uh, a bond in which the woman is, is subjugated is, in a sense, the property of the man. And, you know, our laws still reflect this, the fact that you cannot have a marital rape, uh, you know, the, the, the whole way. And it permeates all state of society, all castes of society. But it, again, it works. It, it, you know, the hierarchies are reflected in all that. Um, so belonging, you know, the idea that others see you as belonging to them, you know. Slavery, when Fule talks about... Uh, slavery, uh, he talks about the practice of caste in Indian society as a form of slavery. And um, similarly, if we can use all these different terms from a past, which do not have the same connotation in the present, but yet we have to be more aware of our history. And, um, you know, now we have a Dalit history month. Um, there, there are, uh, you know, African-American women doing research on history uh, and uh, rewriting really uh, the history of society from different sources, from memory, from oral sources and so on. All this is a part of the change uh, that is coming in our society. And uh, I think I'll stop here. I hope, I hope I haven't talked too long and I'd like to hear from uh, any questions, responses, objections. 
thank you for inviting me thank you so much ma'am for uh, uh, thank you uh, thank you very much uh, professor sonalkar this was really really uh, very you know uh, informative and uh, and also you know i really like the touch of optimism which you have in your uh, you know understanding and whatever you had been presenting so uh, so uh, uh, dr jasmal should we be the should i start with the comments or summary or or then we'll take questions or do you want to start and say something about it how do we go about it uh, you can just present your views okay uh, being the moderator of the session and uh, uh, as far as i am concerned even though this is not my area of expertise i read enough uh, uh enough in uh, feminism but i have recently uh, started reading about the dalit feminist history and uh, arguments and when ma'am was telling about this uh, whole discussion which has gone between um, gopal guru and uh, sharmila rege and then the way bell hooks on the other hand related to black feminism has tried to create some kind of rebellion okay where she is Uh, trying to create a resistance so we can say that somehow we are stuck on this question that whether uh, whether anyone who doesn't belong to a particular community even though like you know i would like to say that if i'm not belonging to the dalit community but i'm also belonging to other caste based community and even my caste is also suffering from some kind of caste based hierarchy still we will have to agree and it has been never uh, the truth i would i must say that the dalit community has been deprived of so many rights just in the name of their caste okay so how this caste system and on the other hand the racial discrimination system is creating an upheaval in the lives of all these people and when we try to fight against such kind of discrimination it seems as if it is uh, only the matter of one's own life it's like you know that if i'm a black woman and if i'm fighting for uh, my rights it seems as if you know it is something which has to do with them then they become them others okay and when a dalit woman or a dalit man asks for rights or fights for that then once again it becomes the uh, um, you know their concern okay once again so how do we move from their concern to our concern because somehow this caste discrimination is affecting everybody you know whether we belong to the upper caste or we belong to the middle class or to the lower class or caste okay it is affecting everybody in some or the other way some people think that it is something which is giving them privilege you know and they are also enjoying those privileges but uh, on the other hand they are also suffering at so many ends so it is this caste system in itself is not just the issue of dalit people or racial discrimination is not just the issue for black women or black man it is a system you know we will have to fight against the system and this point you know the way uh, uh, sunana has already said or commented that the optimism which we have seen through ma'am's lecture that shows that you know i i actually do not agree with this i i can and i apologize for my uh, uh, for my point of view that i don't think that only dalit people or only people who belong to a particular class or caste can talk about their issues until or unless you know because somehow it is segregating them this segregation mm. is once again creating a name okay and and that name is once again creating a problem so until or unless i agree much with sharmila rege's point of view that the fem, the dalit feminist standpoint is something which we will have to adopt and uh, uh, understand in order to fight against this system of caste you know where mm. everybody is suffering uh, from one or the other uh, mm. you know 
you can say atrocities okay so these are my views i don't know i, I will wait for ma'am's comments but sunana you can take up the questions and then at the end of the questions i would like you to invite to say something over okay. whatever ma'am has said sure thank you very much uh, professor dasal for presenting you know and sharing your ideas with us i really like this so uh, i have uh, made some points about the lecture and so i would just want to say that you know uh, in this span of time how professor sonalkar has touched upon really significant issues in a well connected manner so that is why i i would greatly congratulate you ma'am and uh, the students and all the participants are really uh, you know uh, uh, lucky to you know uh, having the and uh, like having an understanding of meeting all these anecdotes so like she starts with the you know uh, the like quoting bell hooks right and that uh, i really like that how she started the uh discussion on feminism and feminist discourse from the point where uh, it is about you know uh, authenticity and the questions of representation that uh, bell hooks says that those who are experiencing the uh, you know the violence or discrimination or any kind of disadvantage under privilege because uh, that is why they are more closer to the truth to society the truth which is though yet known but not affecting everybody equally and that is why many people choose to you know as uh, professor jaiswal you mentioned that you know we always think that like men think that you know gender is a women's issue like it's their problem so there is this kind of tendency we all have created in our society individually and also collectively that whatever is not our problem or whatever does not concern us that is not a problem so that is how we have learned to you know uh, started living lives like that is not at all a problem so like capitalist uh, elite people would not think that uh, poverty is an issue in our country so uh, i very much agree with that uh, so that one point and then she also discussed little about like uh, but re really importantly on dr ambedkar's perspective of gender equality not to favor women but to you know uh, democratize our society because the caste and patriarchy is a problem for the society and not for women or for dalits like uh, how you both have mentioned that you know how caste affects everybody and how patriarchy also affects everybody so that is how he was very passionate about inclusion and upliftment and empowerment of the women of the society and i very much believe that at that point if uh, the issues of you know lgbtq was uh, uh, raised uh, he would definitely support and there are so many researches happening currently on ambedkar's perspective on you know uh, queer philosophy so that and also this very interesting philosophical epistemological idea of becoming and belonging like you know we there is an element of choice that we can choose to become like as she has given several examples that maybe uh, for example all of us we can, we have chosen to be an academic but we cannot choose to be uh, you know uh, my uh, like uh, we cannot choose to be a person belonging to a different uh identity or uh, uh, other than in which we are born so same goes with for brahmins as well like like even when they are privileged or even men even when they are privileged they cannot choose to be become you know a, a woman or a queer person or a dalit person so the choice element is not at all there in the idea of belonging and i think that is what gopal guru wanted to highlight and which is underlined by professor sonalkar here and uh, very interestingly how you know she has discussed on several important aspects of our everyday social so i have been listening closely about you know how on the in the everyday social things are not same as it were 50 or 100 years from now so 
in that uh, very important point which uh, she has made that you know people have so much internalized the caste and patriarchal practices in their everyday life that they no longer re need any reference to a religious patriarchal text right now so that is uh, something very uh, important which she highlighted and uh, and that is why even the urban setting uh, could not prevent caste based atrocities or discrimination which is happening and we all know even though we know that you know uh, the rural people living in the rural regions are suffering in a very different manner than you know how they are suffering in the urban spaces so but still uh, urban lifestyle is not a uh, uh you know escape from the caste based uh, problems so that point and then she also mentioned that you know how caste also uh decides you know uh the access to resources very important resources of health and education and where she mentions very important statistics which was released by ministry of health and women's welfare and uh, there uh, i had also uh, read that and there we found that, uh, it is uh, mentioned that you know dalit women's life span is 20 years 20 years less than non dalit women's life span so that is uh, how you know uh, class uh, aspect also comes into the umbrella of the caste uh, issues in our society so and then also how she talks about public policies that okay public policies are there like uh, she gave the example of uh, anganwadi women or women working at the grassroots level that they are working as voluntary or mostly it's like you know activist uh, or reformers or some kind of aid uh, aids to the society or social improvement but not as permanent employees government employees having proper wage or you know uh, sufficient uh, uh, stability or security job security so those things are not there uh, and this so that is why even public policies at that level are not sufficient in doing justice to the people regarded as downtrodden in our society and uh, then she uh, like uh, after discussing all of that she argues that how caste and patriarchy intertwines with the ideas of capitalism like the uh, no uh, the capitalist market system in which we are living today and all of this combinedly you know uh, put uh, more more hindrances and obstacles uh, to the people who had already been suffering uh, in pre global era so that and uh, and two things which i would uh, i would uh, i would like to uh, you know uh, hear more if there are some questions from uh, you know audience that uh, one thing which um, i am curious to learn about uh, uh, ma'am's perspective professor sonalkar's perspective is uh, one which you mentioned uh, uh, professor deswal about the us them dichotomy that you know once we start theorizing or writing or analyzing or even reflecting on the issues we keep a divide and we find uh, if we find ourselves in the safe zone then we do no longer worry about that so that is one kind of practice i very much uh, though i very much agree with this idea that you know uh, like the, the uh, that identity based argumentation that you know if one person is a woman only a woman can speak of gender uh, and not men can speak of gender and similarly only a dalit can speak of caste and not uh, non dalit can so i am also very much agreeing with that uh, that idea and for me in my work and also uh, the argument in this book i have put forward is that you uh, you know dalit feminism is not a feminism of dalits or for dalits or by the dalits rather dalit feminism is the perspective uh, the theory which takes into consideration the caste perspective because the caste perspective in the gender theories is uh, ignored 
and uh, as it is shown in this uh, book as well and several other places we can find that it has also been you know uh, oppressed or sidelined by the mainstream you know uh, uh, discourse of feminism so that is why anti caste rendering of feminism is very much important at the present time and that is how i use the term dalit so dalit feminism is anti caste feminism because that because caste becomes the primary reason for patriarchal dominance as she has been repeatedly mentioning that how women have been the gateways to the you know uh, inter caste uh, alliance so that is why controlling sexuality of women which is very much uh, which has been discussed nicely in dr ambedkar's work caste in india where he talks about how the practices of sati widowhood and uh, enforced widowhood and child marriage were actually the ways uh, where where women's sexuality were controlled so that you know they could protect the caste system like the women should men keep maintain in the one community only and does not go to another one because inter caste alliance is the beginning of annihilation of caste so that nobody wants whoever is enjoying privilege and that is why so much of you know honor killing and things like that is happening currently because this is a threat to the caste system which is regarded as uh, you know uh, to be honored or something sacred which we need to protect so that happening that is happening so uh, but uh, in the current uh, uh, scenario we have also found uh, also in the uh, latest work of sharmila rege writing caste writing gender she has mentioned about you know uh, criticisms about the appropriation of the you know the dalit writings like how the translations and the interviews or many of the ethnographical studies are not represented properly and many of the western scholars uh, uh, to name julie stephens has also argued that you know how in indian feminist discourse some of the savarna feminists are actually not uh, you know representing their perspective but actually filtering those you know real issues and putting it into the public which not everybody uh, knows because they do, do not have direct access to those people living that reality so about that uh, and also uh, in uh, in one of my work also i discussed this uh, that you know how there are so many uh, references where we find that women who are theorizing gender writing on gender intentionally or unintentionally have maintained this dichotomy of us and them that you know uh, they uh, mention repeatedly uh, about the readers and the writers as us so they do not imagine that a reader of their writing or a writer of the similar kind of issue can be somebody who is non savarna mm -hmm. so and whenever they are talking about dalit women they use the word them and these are really prominent uh, scholars in indian feminism who are using such terms and there are also practices where uh, dalit feminism is uh, sidelined and you know um, uh, regarded as less important than feminism so there are phrases like feminism and other political discourse feminism and other voices so feminism and you know so there has been this practice of othering uh, among the uh, you know feminist discourse so how do we how do we you know uh, resolve that issue when we also want everybody to theorize you know the caste and gender issue so that is one thing on which i would really uh, love uh, professor vandana to uh, talk about if we have time after the questions from the uh, participants and uh, one is also on intersectionality i i would like to hear something more ma'am from you mm -hmm. about intersectionality like of course it is uh um, like it has been generated in the legal context uh but uh black feminism and many of the women of color uh latina feminists uh, have accepted it warm welcomely heartedly uh and using this as a framework uh 
to as a departure in the feminist theorizing not at arrival of non patriarchal you know uh, theory uh, but as a departure in the writings of uh, feminism so how do you see that of course uh, we know that in 2015 you know uh, professor nivetha meenan had written uh, uh, a very debated article uh, critiquing intersectionality uh, where she accepts the uh, intersectionality uh, at the global level because we in so called third world and based on the race uh, you know uh, are different that is why she accepts that at that level but for the internal differences of the caste she rejects the same concept so that is very problematic and uh, so that our, uh, article had uh, you know created some debates uh, among the feminists and then professor mary e john and meena gopal from the same institute as professor sonalkar had responded to that and then i think that debate is still going on and many of the um, dalit feminists like feminists who are working from the anti caste perspective are uh, welcoming intersectionality and some of them are saying that it is necessary but not sufficient so i am also curious and working on that so i would really love ma'am to say about that and i think i i have made all all the points and i am really really very happy uh, that you know this was a wonderful lecture and professor jaswal this is great to see you after so long uh, you are so active and uh, you are really inspiring i met you like several years ago and i saw that wow you are always active even during pandemic you know so i very much take inspiration from you and professor vandana of course Uh, as a emerging young scholar i very much look forward to um, feminists like you to you know put hard work and efforts and these kind of deliberative events where we get this opportunity to interact and communicate and also contemplate together so i very much thank you uh, both and uh, congratulate the philosophy project for having this really great uh, initiative and uh, now let's take the questions from the uh, participants is there are some in, in the oh, have put in the chat i can see oh okay ma'am yes. so uh, do you want me to uh, should i be reading it or you want to respond right away uh well uh, there is one question on the dalit feminist standpoint to elaborate uh, then Uh, on intersectionality which uh, you had also asked about mm -hmm. uh the term dalit well i i don't think i'll go into that because you know the use of the term dalit by dalits mm -hmm. yeah th there are some who oppose it uh, but i don't really want to get into that debate just now totally uh and again okay uh okay about privilege uh, about brahminical patriarchy uh and the very important question you raised uh, sunaina about appropriation and the, that danger and uh, okay let me just uh, try and address these questions together and also what uh, uh, dr jaiswal had, had had said you know Uh, because I, i let's start off with this whole thing of privilege and and so on what i um, think recent you know the, the the thing that has happened more recently is that at least privilege is being acknowledged you know that those who are privileged are willing to say that yes we are privileged uh, rather than uh, saying that oh we don't practice caste um, so um we are privileged enough to be able to ignore caste in our daily lives and it's not uh, a virtue stemming from us but rather the fact that uh, you know uh, i could grow up in complete ignorance of of caste discrimination and i myself don't practice it but that is not enough to say that you yourself don't practice it okay you can be totally unaware of certain things and therefore insensitive 
uh, to people who are around you. Um, and it's not, uh, well, you know, this other thing of um, speaking over and um, speaking more loudly than the oppressed, being more articulate and so on. Uh, and also this question of translations, whether we are appro appropriating uh, the writings. Now, I have done some translation myself. And uh, you see, it, it has been an education for me uh, to try and be as faithful as possible. I would welcome uh, criticism, you know, specific criticism that here you have uh, not been able to convey what. But I'll, I'll also tell you an example of, um, I was editing uh, a translation um, done by somebody else, uh, another Savarna person, uh, of uh, an interview with a Dalit woman, uh, in fact, Professor Kumut Paude. Okay, now she is, she was talking about how she, her family gave a lot of value to education and encouraged her to study and to uh, even take up the study of a subject like Sanskrit. Uh, but uh, they still lived in a colony where there were not many people who appreciated education in the same way as her family did. And uh, therefore, you know, there would be a lot of noise around, there would be quarrels. Um, and that was the atmosphere in which she grew up. And one of the words she uses in Marathi is, you know, Shivara, uh, is um, Shivi is a curse, okay? And um, so people cursing and shouting at each other and then uh, her trying, she's describing the situation in which she goes up. Uh, whereas within her family, everybody is encouraging her. Now, when she uses this word, it is translated um, as vulgar, okay? Now, this I felt was not correct. And as I was editing that work, I instead I replaced it by the phrase loaded with curses, you know. So which is the description of people using certain kind of language. It's not judgmental, whereas the word vulgar is judgmental. You know, something vulgar is you, you are in a privileged position or you are in a more cultured position and uh, condemning something. Uh, so, uh, somebody else's culture as being vulgar, which this author herself is not doing. She's just describing it as, the, as a language which is loaded with curses. Okay. Now, this is where a certain kind of sensitivity, uh, I mean, there are always disputes about translation. This may not be the ideal translation, but at least uh, one can avoid bringing in a certain kind of moral judgment which comes from a position of privilege which is not there in the Dalit author's writing and if one is translating it this is I'm just giving you an example here okay um, as far as appropriation I you know I have been also criticized I you know it's almost as if oh a Savarna oh these Savarna translators you know as a pejorative term okay now, for me, translation is itself a way of expanding my understanding. The fact that I know that I write well in English, uh, you know, I'm not ashamed or in, uh, sort of too mod over modest to say that I have an understanding of the Marathi language also, and also of uh, a certain anti caste. Uh, activity. I have moved in various different social strata uh, and I try and be as faithful as I can. Now, I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I would uh, object if anybody says that I have no right to do this. Okay. Uh, reject it. Don't read it if you don't like it. In fact, uh, one of the people I, you know, uh, I, I don't think Urmila Pawar would mind if I told, uh, I quoted her as saying, 
to me that uh, the translation of um, you know that the, we also made history several people told her that it was very readable and uh, you know that because of this translation they could come to know about women in the ambedkar movement and so on so one does one's best okay um one has certain skills which can be used for a certain purpose okay and it's i didn't do it because it had become fashionable or anything i did it because i found this was something that interested me okay now um criticisms you know specific criticisms i would welcome but oh who are you to do this i don't think it's is uh, exactly uh, the right approach uh now this question of intersectionality here i think you know my uh, kind of reservations about this term are twofold you know one is because i have a certain marxist background and uh i especially mentioned kimberly crenshaw's you know legalistic and practical kind of use of the term it was of course then taken up but it is taken up in an atmosphere uh, in an intellectual atmosphere where uh, a marxist analysis of society and in in a very post structural and post modern kind of context where you talk about the formation of the subject through various uh, influences uh whereas i would also be interested in underlying structures you know when i talk about global capitalism when i talk about a system of caste patriarchy whereas the term intersectionality focuses on the individual subject and then it again i think somewhere not everybody uses it in this way but sometimes it can be a certain kind of tokenism you know that uh, okay we remember that uh, you know the dalit women are thrice oppressed and all that you know, th th that term again which is so if we can talk about the structures and th then we come back to the fact that capitalism oppresses not just the working class but even people who are you know in the middle layers who are um mid the, the middle classes the um intellectuals uh who can understand and you know just after independence there was an idea that the middle classes because of their privilege in terms of being articulate being literate and being and having a certain clout you know when you know one example of this was when uh, gradually the um, we used to have when i was younger uh, a ration card system where everybody got ration cards and that was what, you know instead of the aadhar card that was your identity kind of thing and because i mean middle class people usually used it only for sh getting sugar at a slightly lower price and whereas there were food grains and other things available also the point is that uh middle class people using these ration shops also could act as certain vigilantes that you know the the rules were followed properly and the poor were not uh, uh denied what their uh, they were entitled to and so on so there was a certain kind of moral um what shall we say uh a moral responsibility for the working of certain um uh, state welfare systems and that's why a certain universalization rather than the targeting where then now ration cards are only for the poor and the poor are those who can't speak for themselves and who can be uh, denied their rights very easily and now it has nothing to do with the you know it is like 
we used to talk about inequality as a problem of society. Now we talk about poverty as a problem of our society. These are different viewpoints. Because I'm, when you say inequality is a problem, I'm uncomfortable to live in a society where there are such vast differences between rich and poor. When you say poverty is a problem in the society, what is happening, you know, the rich are getting richer at a fantastic rate. They have gained some trillions of dollars have been transferred from the poor to the rich during the period of the pandemic, uh, over, you know, over the world. Um, that is not a problem. Poverty is a problem. Okay. It's the same kind of thing that caste uh, is, affects all of us. Caste brings a certain kind of blindness uh, in, in the privileged. And that blindness should be fought against for our own sakes as well. For being a little more intelligent about our surroundings and being able to be a little more effective in terms of values that we profess to, to believe in and so on. Okay. Um, so I think talking about the underlying structures is important. Uh, locating people in that rather than saying that uh -huh, this person is characterized by this, this and this. I'm not saying intersectionality is totally useless, but uh, I think it is often misused and uh, used in a uh, rather narrow fashion and sometimes just lip service also sometimes. Thank you, Professor, for answering these uh, questions. And uh, there are some more questions coming. Uh, if you see that, you know, some it seems that the participants are really curious and also thinking within themselves and then asking you to have them some kind of way out. So, nice. That's good. This is one. There is one question by Sharon. So, yes. Uh, Ma'am, would you like to read it or should we? Should we read uh, the question? Yes, please. Please. Yeah. So, Sunana? Sure. So, uh, so there is... Uh, uh, this, uh, I think uh, other questions you have responded uh so one thing i think the first which uh fozia fozzy had asked that you know economic uh, education and economic independence is the best way to raise dalit women but still these two factors are far away for from them to get it so what do you think about it uh you can choose about it maybe i will be reading more questions if you're fine with that mm -hmm. okay. is that okay yeah so, yeah, this is a slightly different question. And, uh, yes, it is like, you know, thinking about how it's not uh, directly related to your lecture. So maybe you can choose. And uh, one is, uh, what can, can be understood by a Dalit feminist? Uh, what could be understood by a Dalit feminist standpoint? And how understanding it helps us, you know, understand the society better. So... This also seems, uh, Unnati uh, seems curious about, you know, what do we understand about what is a Dalit feminist standpoint and how Dalit feminist standpoint helps us to understand the society better. That is one. And uh, do you want to respond right away, ma'am? Or should, should I continue? Uh, actually, I have talked about Dalit feminist standpoint. Uh, I, I don't think I want to add anything more at this point. Okay. okay. Uh, so I will read another question. Um, so Stuti Mehta has written, I never thought about how intersectionality is moving away from a collectivistic view towards being more individualistic. However, it not it inevitable that given the insights afforded to us by the intersectionality framework, we put more emphasis on the individual and the subjective by default. Intersectionality reveals the sheer range of different experiences. So how can we take a collectivistic view of it without compromising on these differences? On which you, I think you have already, uh, you know, mentioned 
so if you want to add something to it you uh, yes you okay or then then one question we are skipping because uh, uh, that is uh, too controversial right now to take and it is an internal de debate within the lit community okay. Uh, okay i think you have also discussed about how understanding uh, brahminical patriarchy helps in you know dalit feminist theory so maybe if you want to add something about that you can put and one person uh, one is a comment i agree by shri toma ghosh i agree that casteism racism patriarchy etc is a problem of everyone in the system both the privileged and the oppressed but it is extremely difficult to express the issues of those who are at the bottom of the ladder if you are in a privileged position some are hesitant to do so in fear they will speak over the oppressed this is extremely prevalent in the current online activism scene i hope you can reach a point where dalits and others can speak for themselves until then we have work towards not sidelining them while bringing up their suffrages so you want to comment something about this now actually i had looked at most of these uh, in the margin uh, of these questions and i think i've tried to answer them except okay. for this thing on education and finally the one that came up later on belonging and slavery and and uh, something yes, in the last yeah. three yeah right okay um, but let me start with this question about education and economic independence sure. okay and now the sad thing is that employment of women is actually decreasing in our society you know women's participation in the economy uh, and it's only the most unskilled and low paid jobs that women have to do by default uh, so that you know one is construction work another is uh, domestic service you know uh, which and and in construction work also women always are relegated to the role of helpers they are never uh, you know they, they can never advance in their work or uh, use their skills to earn better wages uh, as far as domestic services is, is concerned i think this is one of the major fault lines of our society where so many of us you know uh, if the if a woman has is going to be a working woman Uh, she relies on paid domestic help to such a great degree are there any other ways of dealing with this why do we not confront the men in our households uh, to also share the burden because this has happened in in other societies where um, you know such cheap domestic help is not available in our country it is available because no other jobs are available so economic independence yes it does depend on, on education but it also depends on a certain kind of employment being made available it will mean a major economic restructuring uh, of society and uh, it's a restructuring where you know again now i i'm not talking entirely about uh, a state owned kind of uh, uh, socialism but we i think if we spend much more on uh providing health and education especially to everyone uh and out of this more needs will arise and a certain and we are willing to uh spend money on this this will create employment of a better kind as well um it's not uh, something that can happen overnight so um, you know yes this is the direction we have to move in uh okay I, there was something question is i would like uh, ma'am that is from manobna matam uh, to expound on the connection between the concepts of belonging and mentality of slavery very interesting question yes uh, yes i mentioned that actually because uh, gopal guru talks about becoming and belonging and when he's talking about belonging uh, he dismisses he says of course you know uh, the idea of belonging to somebody else 
is something from the stage of slavery. Okay. And then he carries on about belonging to a community and the sense of identification uh, with the community and how you accept the cultural norms of that community, how you accept a certain kind of social authority when you belong to, a, when you identify with the community and so on. But uh, that's why I just, uh, uh, well, so, so belonging, he is talking about it in a slightly different way and talking about becoming something as a more conscious, you know, you, as, as uh, you, you yourself said, uh, about, you know, you can choose to be an academic, you can choose your career to some extent, you can choose where you live within certain limits and, and so on. You can uh, choose to get married or not get married. Again, that is something which, uh, you know, uh, social norms, uh, especially somehow push women. So if a woman is not married, uh, she is looked down on by society. Um, and um, a man is not married well, it is slightly more tolerated and people will sort of uh, find ways to help him look after himself you know, because men are not able to look after themselves. It is considered to be a part of masculinity not to be able to look after yourself. But um, um, so these kind of norms, um, what I was trying to say is that somewhere uh, in the way that caste patriarchy works, men are considered to be responsible for the women of their own caste. And this is underlined by saying that um, Savarna men, especially upper caste men, have access to women of the lower castes. And this is something, this is a way in which they can show their superiority and they can um, put down men of the lower castes. So that, you know, uh, women's bodies are the medium through which caste superiority is asserted. Uh, and what this goes along with is, you know, my woman, um, um, when, you know, in some economic studies, it is found that, especially in rural areas, when uh, a family goes up in economic status, uh, the idea is that my, my, the women of our family, my women, will not go and work in the fields. It happened with the Green Revolution in Punjab. You know, uh, when a lot of mechanization took place. Earlier, women of the Punjab were working, I mean, of all castes, you know, and maybe not the very, very up, upper caste, but across society were working alongside their men and they were, they had a better social status. When you have mechanization which privileges men, a model which is brought in from, from outside, from the West, and women, and it brings greater prosperity, and women are made to sit at home. Decades later, we find that it is the rural parts of Punjab and Haryana where the male-female ratio is worst, because women no longer have the same social status because they are not participating in labor. So these, all these things, our women and women through their cooking practices, through their dress, through their behavior, through their, the way that they celebrate festivals uh, are supposed to uh, preserve the culture of the caste. They're supposed to, uh, you know, this is the way it is done in our caste. This is the way we do it. This is the way our people do it. And the women are uh, made the agents of this. So that belonging and the mentality of slavery, you know, somewhere, uh, it's not exactly, I mean, it's not exactly the same, but still, this is the way in which uh, caste makes 
uh-huh. women the agents of preserving caste and there is a definite idea of you know uh-huh. my woman will behave like this my woman will not do this kind of thing that's uh, that is ultimately can be called kind of slavery thank you ma'am uh, there are some questions from the youtube so participants who are attending on youtube live they have asked some questions so okay. one question is borrowing understanding from gayatri spivax can the subaltern speak uh, i pose a question of agency what kind of strategies if agency hold a dalit feminist may employ and they also added the same person what is the ethical imperative for the non dalit and the privileged uh, so maybe you can take this and then there are several other questions i would ask um yes uh the Eight first one about uh, agency look this is not a question for me to answer at all you know how is agency to be asserted um when it is asserted recognize it as being agency but uh, what i was saying in my earlier talk was that dalit women are asserting themselves in different ways today okay. uh, and um, what can what can the more privileged do listen more try and understand uh, what changes are taking place what changes are not taking place and that's why i think um, you know literature and culture are very important uh, i know that uh, sharmila again in her last book just which is posthumously published i think she talks a lot about uh, you know ambedkarite groups and their music and song and so on um then you know something like the gathering of huge numbers of people in chaitya bhumi in bombay on 6th of december um it is considered to be something that concerns only dalits and it is considered to be something of a nuisance for the city now if we can change these perceptions that's a beginning it's a very small beginning but it is a beginning okay let's not think that we can solve other people's problems we can just try not to be an obstacle we can try not to be insensitive about it okay uh, thank you professor uh, one more question or if we have time uh, we can take one more after this so this question is uh, what do you mean when you say that middle caste are invoking caste structure more than the brahmin or so called upper caste is it really that brahmin upper caste are not engaging in caste issues so that is uh- one and uh, if you want to take up there is uh, one question uh, from nikayata the previous question was from preeti kohli the next question is from nikayata and uh, she is uh, saying that is uh, intersectionality inadequate to explain the relationship between caste patriarchy and capitalism or does it strengthen the argument for the relationship so uh, these two things uh, first maybe you take ma'am as you and think. these will be the last ones sanana okay so no more questions i guess yeah 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 this is last please. just please remind me of the first one again i slightly lost the thread this uh, question um, that uh, how middle caste oh yes yes mid- about the middle castes yes uh there have been some studies now you know and uh, the whole way that the hierarchy of the caste system works see very often the upper castes are also upper class and therefore they can live um in a more 
shall we say westernized kind of setup um they can i mean they move so easily through society they move through their education they find jobs uh, uh, uh you know through contacts without even being aware that they are being helped by these contacts uh you know and believing that it is solely their merit because people will say oh how smart you are and it's so nice to see one of our uh, boys doing so well and you know uh, there is an opening in my office and uh, it it is not even uh, perceived as now the uh, middle class have to struggle much more they have to struggle against uh, these prejudices but then they because the obc reservation is something which is still only just coming in and it's not practiced everywhere they see reservations for scs and sts as coming in their way they like to see themselves as superior somebody because they are also being humiliated at the same time by the upper castes i mean that's the way i'm not blaming them but definitely the upper caste can live in the illusion that they are somewhere above caste uh whereas uh, the middle castes can't and therefore they are the ones who perhaps more explicitly practice caste very often even caste violence you know, how violence actually is practiced who actually carries it out who actually benefits from it maybe something someone quite different and someone who actually takes the risk of of committing violence and uh, exposing themselves to um, cruel practices against somebody else and a third person is is uh, gaining the advantages of all that that's i would, I would say and thank you thank you very much i think i'll stop now taking up all these questions and uh, it seems the participants are really you know curious and want to hear more uh, but since we are running out of time so i would say uh, that uh, this was a great session wonderful learning session for everybody thank you very much uh, for your uh, thank you very much ma'am for uh, having uh, this discussion and answering all these questions and now i would uh, want uh, professor jaswal to conclude or uh, comment whatever she wants to say thank you very much thank, thank you. you so much sunana uh, ma'am i would just like to add one thing if you allow me that uh, perhaps the point you were making regarding the middle class and um, people of middle caste you know even though we do not very usually use this phrase middle caste but middle cla uh, class as well as middle caste do exist and uh, if we agree with whatever has been said by partha chatterjee okay that the way uh, middle class has become middle class women became the symbol of indian culture because they somehow hold this responsibility of uh, showing that okay this is something which is making our culture very much different from the western culture so probably the point you were trying to make here could be uh, understood through this perspective as well where higher class women are more prone to westernization and more prone to getting some other kind of privileges where our middle class women are still struggling with the caste system and class system and uh, uh, struggling also with the authenticity of their identity that yes they are respectable they are the women who should Uh, who are the bearer of their culture and they are also presenting some kind of example to others like you know it has uh, since i belong to banya community so i take this uh, liberty to say a few things about banya community it seems as if banya community's women are taking more uh, uh, you know are are making more efforts to show that they are pure okay in terms of following all the rituals in terms of following all the festivals properly uh, then the saverns like you know the brahmins and uh, other caste upper caste 
because they think that they are pure and they are greater than the other uh, superior classes and they want also want to put up an example of how an indian woman could be you know respectable indian woman so that has also given us an upshot to how we can look at this whole uh, permutation and combination of caste system which exists not in one way you know this whole thing is not working in a linear way through which we can understand that how caste is intermingled with gender we can also understand that how caste is affecting in various ways to all the sections of society so i don't know whether uh, i have done any justice to the points you have presented but that was my point of view which i wanted to discuss here and thank you so much ma'am for uh, uh, elaborating all these concepts without falling into the trap of intersectionality where it seems as if as if you know everything has become subjective okay uh, without going into that trap you have very wonderfully tried to show the interrelation between all these categories okay which have been not only uh, practically but philosophically troubling us at how do we face these questions so once again thank you so much ma'am uh, for your inputs for your lecture wonderful lecture and i hope that uh, all those uh, who have heard your lectures and will hear your lecture later on with your recordings because it is not convenient for everyone to uh, attend the lecture at the same time so we have also uh, made this arrangement that recording of this lecture could be available with people and then later on they will have to attempt some quiz uh, uh, so that they can get certificate so thank you so much ma'am for contributing uh, in such a great manner to our certificate course and i would like to thank sunana for moderating the section very well and uh, you know it's good uh, always to see that how we can interact with each other even though we belong to different cultures okay so uh, and thank you so much everyone who thank is here and the team organizing team who is wonderfully working behind the screen without mentioning any names so uh, thank you so much everyone and uh, once again ma'am so we would like to have more sessions uh, with you okay and uh, we'll keep uh, talking and interacting with you Thank you, Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. And uh, the quiz will be available on uh, uh, today is eleventh on thirteenth throughout the day from ten a.m. to seven p.m. Okay, so the quiz will be available from ten a.m. to seven p.m. on thirteenth. Okay, so goodbye, everyone. Have goodbye. a good day. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.